Welcome to Trinity Central. We exist to make God central to our lives and our world. You are listening to a recording of one of our Sunday messages. For more information, please go to trinitycentral.org. Yeah, well, good morning, everyone. That was a great introduction, wasn't it? As we talk about Advent, we talk about Emmanuel, God with us. I can't think of a better way to celebrate God with us than to celebrate the fact that God has been and is with us. And he's doing amazing, miraculous things among us. If I, if I could simply give you a bit of a heads up of where we're going to go today, God with us means that things are about to change. When God shows up, things don't stay the same. When, when, when Jesus came, everything changed in that moment. And when God came into my life the very first time, even as a young boy, everything was transformed. And I'm going to suggest to you that our invitation, Emmanuel, God with us, the, the expectation that we have, the invitation that we've been given by the Father is that we come into his presence. I have this prophetic sense in my heart that we're about to see a breakout, or maybe it's a break in, of the Holy Spirit into our services. God wants his house back. And God's inviting us into the season of incredible breakthrough. And I I can't think of a better way to celebrate this than to celebrate it at Advent. You know, that with at the end of of a chronological year and the beginning of a new year, what is it that God is about to do in in a new year? What is it that God has done? Praise God for testimonies. But what is it that he's about to do in this new season? Hey, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 9, a very familiar passage. Verses 1 through 7. This will be the text that we'll build our our theme from today. It says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those in darkness. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations, the way by the sea, beyond the Jordan. Let me pause here. That what what this, the prophet Isaiah, 800 approximate years before the coming of Christ, he saw the day when the Messiah would come and he would walk the shores of the Galilee, this place of darkness. It was called and kind of considered uh, uh, the outer limits of the Jewish people. It was the land of the, of the backward, the wayward, the uneducated people. And that's where the Messiah would come, a land known for gloom, for darkness. We we'll see the light of the world shining there first. First. That's the heart of God. He shows up with the needs of the greatest. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad he shows up and walked into your life and into your world? That's the Father that we worship. That's the God that we serve. Verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar crossed their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Verse 6, for unto us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. One thing I I have uh, that I don't like, one of my personal pet peeves, is people who give bad directions. You, you know when you go, you're in Costco and you're looking for that one really odd item and you go to a person that works there, I think it's on aisle 23. I mean, aisle 23 is about 14 blocks long, right? And, and it's like a little help here would be really great. Or you're, you're in an unfamiliar area of the country and you pull up to a little country gas station. You say, I'm looking for this address. And the guy says, you know, it's, it, you got to go a little further past the old elevator. Well, it's not there anymore. But you know where the old elevator used to be. You take a left there and about 300 or 400. I don't know how long. How far is it, Emmy? You know, you hear this back and forth. I don't like it when I get bad directions. I love it when someone comes along and says, hey, where are you going? I'm heading that way. I'll show you. I'll lead you there. 
And that's what we see in this passage because the scripture says the people who lived in darkness, who are walking in darkness, have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep, deep darkness, a light has shone. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to show us a way that he could walk beside his darkness, as you know, generates fear and anxiety. Have you been out for a walk in the dark? And all of a sudden you hear that noise coming out of like, what is that sound? I remember going camping with uh, some young guys. And maybe it wasn't the best thought, but one of the young guys brought an outdoor magazine with him. And just before bed, just before sleep, he read an article about a bear uh, grizzly bear attack on campers. Pitch black in the bush, in the tent. About two in the morning, I hear this whimper in the sleeping bag beside me. And he says, Steve, are you awake? And I said, I'm awake. He says, I'm afraid. So why are you afraid? I think I just heard a grizzly bear in the woods. And it was a squirrel chattered in the tree. Like, I knew it was a squirrel. But in his mind, this fear, this terror overtook him because of the darkness. And our imaginations fills in the blanks and we have these frightening thoughts. And for Israel, this people, this land living in darkness, in great darkness, at the time that Isaiah wrote this, the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, the 10 northern tribes, were living under the domination of Assyrian oppression, darkness. And for, the, and for Judah, those two tribes of Judah, the shadow that hung ominously over them, the gloom that they, and the distress that they were experiencing was the fact that Assyria was knocking on the door, threatening to take over the kingdom. Praise God for good King Hezekiah and his heart for God that, that, that delayed the overtaking of Israel, of Judah rather. This was the backdrop. This was the backdrop of Isaiah's prophecy, this prophetic promise that one day the Messiah would come. Oppression, difficulty, darkness, how about our world? The prophetic word is for us as well. Certainly it was for this time in Israel, but it's also for all times, for all of us. And into this dark world, Jesus came. Into this dark world, Jesus is the light of the world. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It was as if Jesus was saying, I'm going that direction. Come with me, I'll show you the way. He didn't just send directions. He didn't do what that guy in, Co in Costco did for me. Well, it was about aisle 23, about halfway down the left. He went with. He came. He walked on the planet with us. His feet were dusty like our feet get dusty. He lived among us. He knew cold and deprivation. He understood hunger. He said the, the uh, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He gets us. He gets us. And he came to show us the way, to lead us to the Father. He didn't simply give directions. He came to be the direction. His brilliance pierces the darkness. Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. And that's really good news for people stumbling. Not sure where to go, not sure what to do. Have you known those times in your life? I certainly have. God, I need your help. I don't know, what, Lord, what do I do now? What do I do with this teenage child? What do I do with this health condition? What do I do? Father, help me, I need your guidance. Jesus came to shine the light of Jesus and to light of the brilliance of heaven into our dark world, that was good news. He came to reveal the Father and the Father's characteristics. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What's our role in all this? As I kind of build out my introduction here, our role is to give really good directions as well. To, that we would be able to give the, the directions pointing the way to the Father, to our world. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. He puts it on us. You are the light of the world. Shine the spotlight of your faith into other people's areas of darkness. I want you, son and daughter, Jesus says to us, to be my representatives, my ambassadors to a very difficult, very dark world. I want you to show the way. I want you to lead people to me, to be the guides, the ambassadors, the directors. It's interesting that when we step into this, we can say like the Apostle Paul did, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow. Let me show you the way there. Let me lead you there. Come along. I'll get you there. I'll take you to the, to the Father. And in this prophetic promise, we see this place of divine comfort for the people of Israel and for all of us. It's interesting, the verses 3 through 5, we kind of we skip over because it's not, 
it, it feels kind of heavy and dark. But he says that in that day, in the day when the Messiah comes, the nation would be enlarged, joy would increase like the time of harvest. Then he makes this reference to as in the day of Midian's defeat. Reflecting on the time when Gideon, remember the story of Gideon? Midian would come in every year at harvest time and it would pillage the land, would steal from them just as they were gathering their harvest. They would come and they would, and you find, you find in that moment Gideon winnowing wheat in a wine vat, trying desperately to save a little bit of the harvest to protect and provide for his family. And that's where God showed up and said to him, Mighty man of valor, I've called you to take the people of Israel and lead them into victory over the Midianites. And he said, I think you got the wrong address. I, I, not me, God. I, mean, I'm, I'm the, I have nothing. I have nothing to offer you. I'm the youngest in my family. My family is the poorest in Israel. Wrong address. And God says, you're the guy. And the same God says that to every one of us when we think that we should dismiss ourselves from God's service or, or because we look at our inability and God says, yay, you're the ones I want. I choose you because I know you'll give me all the glory. The greatest miracles happen when people who know they don't have much. I thought it was quite good what, what Reese said earlier as we were celebrating their 25th anniversary. and said, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I think that should be the stance of every disciple of Jesus Christ. Lord, I don't have much. A couple of loaves and a couple of random fish, but what I got is yours. And if we step into that place of obedience to Jesus, saying, Lord, here, take what I have. God says, I will use you powerfully. This prophetic promise was that if you see this passage, verses of three through five, it says a couple of things. It says, first of all, that the harvest would be retained. It says that the bondage of slavery would be broken and the people would know freedom and joy. That the battlefield would, would, would be completely different and we would have victory in the place of demoralizing defeat. Does this sound like good news? And then additionally, it says that the battlefield attire, all the, 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 the memory, the clothing that was stained with blood, the, the memories of those difficult warfare days would be removed and they would be burnt. Think about this. God says when, when the Spirit of God comes, everything changes. The victories that seem just so elusive and, and the battles and the bondages and the troubles that seem to be so predominant. When Jesus shows up, everything changes. And that's the point. In our season of warfare, in our season of battle, we have this invitation to step. Now, at the time of this writing, Isaiah was speaking to a people <clears throat> that were living in the shadow of the Assyrian armies. And this was fantastic prophecy, great news for this nation. But what are the qualities? What are the family characteristics and qualities of the coming Messiah? We find it in this, in this passage. For unto us a child is born. To us a Savior is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Let's break it down a little bit. Wonderful Counselor. Uh, the word wonderful here is actually an interesting word. It, it often and regularly is translated and, and referred to as supernatural. He is the supernatural counselor. Speaking of the day the Messiah would come, the Messiah who would come with words, supernatural words that would bring eternal life. It wasn't just coming to speak on his own, but when he spoke, things happened. Supernatural. He spoke death. He spoke to death and life occurred. He spoke to, to dead people and they were raised. He spoke to disease and it and he spoke to demons, and they, were, and they fled. He spoke, and things happened. He spoke, and eternal life came to the people. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He came and brought life. And now when he comes back again, according to Charles Ryrie, he says, and when he returns, he will rule with perfect wisdom. Praise God. He is the supernatural counselor. He is the mighty God. In this phrase, it predicts the ultimate victory over, uh, of Jesus over sin, over sickness, over disease, and over death. He is mighty God. Can anything stand against our God? And the scripture says no. That's the point. He is wonderful counselor. He is mighty God. Praise God for a testimony even today. The sickness bowed us knee to Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the everlasting father. Literally, everlasting father means the father from eternity. No beginning, no end, the Father from eternity. And the promise contained here is that the Messiah would come, the Messiah Jesus, and he would eternally guard, he would eternally supply, he would eternally care for and protect his kids. He, he doesn't have a time limit. He's not like me, he doesn't get old and expire. He's, he's from eternity, the God from eternity. 
the Father from eternity, always available to us. And then finally, Prince of Peace. The word here is Shalom. The Prince of Shalom, the fullest sense of wholeness, prosperity, tranquility. He is that God. He is the, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But when Jesus comes, it gets messy as we turn the corner. When he comes, he comes into our world and he does amazing, wonderful, glorious things and he also contends with us and with broken systems because if he's not Lord of everything, he's not Lord at all. And that's the point of this message today. There's an invitation to step into a place of allowing Jesus to be everything, not just some, not just part. He wants to invade every aspect of our lives. And it's interesting, uh, when Jesus shows up, things might get a little bit messy at times. I'm hoping that as we talk about God with us, Emmanuel, that our hearts are prepared to experience the delightful consequences of God breaking in on the church. I mean, it, 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 things may not be packaged and pretty. It may look different. I'm, I have, I will see if I tell some stories. But when Jesus, the Messiah, came as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Matthew chapter 21, he showed up at the Father's house. And he did this most amazing thing. Perhaps I'll read it, and then we'll talk about it. Matthew 20, 21, verses 12 through 17. And Jesus entered the temple courts, and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my father's house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it into a den of robbers. Mark's gospel says, my father's house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these kids are saying? He had, yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. He left them and went to the city called Bethany where he spent the night. The courtyard of the Gentiles. Around the temple was an open courtyard, and that was called the courtyard of the Gentiles. And this is the setting of this passage of scripture. Around the edges of the perimeter, there were people that come, the vendors who came specifically to set up their wares and sell things that were approved for the temple service. But the intention of the courtyard of the Gentiles initially was so that seekers would come. They would come near. Maybe Gentiles from other countries would come and they would listen and they would hear the worship and, and they would hear the prayer and perhaps these seekers would find their way home to Messiah. Perhaps they find their way home to the Father. Perhaps they find their way back. And this was to be an introduction to this loving God and perhaps an adoption into the loving God's family. The courtyard of the Gentiles was so that these people could come close and they could hear. But the problem was is that the context of the story is that it had become something incredibly different, something very, very different than perhaps what the intention was. Because the goal was if they came and they heard and they saw, then perhaps they would stay. But what happened in the storyline, what we see here, is that Jesus says, but you are making this into a den of robbers. Or another translator says, you're making it into a lair of predatory people. I mean, you see, they're, they're preying upon the people. So we see corruption everywhere. We're seeing bad directions giving to the people here. <clears throat> First of all, the, you see corrupt vendors who charged outrageous prices for temple-sanctioned sacrifices. They were making their money by inflating the, the sacrifices that were being sold there. Secondarily, you see a, a corrupt system that required them to exchange their common, ordinary Roman authorized currency for temple money or temple currency for the offerings at inflated at inflated currency uh, uh, exchange rates. Can you imagine that? Coming in, if, if they met, if Reese met you at the door on the way in here today and say, hey, we're taking an offering, but by the way, you can't use Canadian currency. We have, we have Holy Trinity money here that you have to purchase. And so for every hundred bucks you give, and we'll give you 80 bucks back, but, but 
And these guys were packing, patting their pockets with the profits off these pilgrim people that were coming. It was just insane. And Jesus was like, what are you doing here? So you see corrupt vendors, you see a corrupt system of exchange, and then you see corrupt leaders who were motivated by their own greed, and they made a circus environment out of coming to the temple, coming to worship God. The, the, the scripture gives us an indication that the priests were actually profiting from all this. They took their cut from the vendors. This was their business. They had a little side gig going on. And Jesus was infuriated by this. And you see, then, then again, these authentic Jewish worshipers that were coming, they had to tolerate all this craziness and navigate their way through all these vendors and all this noise to find themselves in the presence of God. That's not the environment that God wants for the church. And then additionally, you see the seekers, the Gentiles that came. And they must have thought, I don't get it. This is not what I read about in the writings of the prophets. This is not what I heard. I, where is the God of miracles? Where is the God who delivered Israel from Egypt? Where is the God who provided food and water for the people for 40 years? Where is the God of Elijah that called down fire from heaven? Where is the God who brought healing to Naaman? Where is the God of Isaiah who promised and prophetically that there'd be another time and another day? Where is the God of Israel? This doesn't, it's better back at home. It's better with what I was, it was what I used to be and what I used to do is better. This is confusing. Bad directions. Bad directions. And the heart of God is for us to experience this place of coming to know God and seeing what it looks like. And I, I imagine that they, at that time, those Gentile seekers came and said, this is not what I expected. Folks, without meaning to be, without intending to be demeaning. When our culture looks in on the church in North America, what do they say today? Is this what they're expecting? No, not Trinity Central. I love this church, and God's doing amazing things. Sincerely. Not a joke. I'm being sincere. But the church in North America needs house cleaning. Jesus showed up to clean house, to take the Father's house back, to make it a place that was safe, a place where the people that were seekers could encounter the Lord. This, what we see in North America, is not the heart of God for his church. It's not a glorious, it's not a radiant church. And there's an invitation for God to come, God with us, to show up. And when he shows up, things change. It's interesting that Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 56, verses 6 and 7, announced today, listen to this, and foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, seekers, to serve him, to love him, and to worship him, these I will bring to my holy mountain, thus to the temple mount, and I will give them joy in my house of prayer, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. God prophetically sent out an invitation to the nations that beyond Israel, God says, I want them all, I want everyone. God so loved the world that he gave. It's not God's desire that anyone should perish. So he sent out an invitation to come to Father's house to experience something new, to be part of this new thing that God was doing called family, to be adopted in because the, sh the shed blood of Jesus, the redemptive work that was accomplished on the cross and through the empty tomb. Praise God, he says, my family needs more people. And that's the invitation he's given. There'll come a day when foreigners will come, they'll bind themselves to me, and my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, all nations. Now, Jesus shows up. He enters this temple scene, the, the courtyard of the, of the Gentiles, and what he's all troubled him. Like, this is not the way my father's house is intended to run. This is not what it's supposed to look like. And with... with with anger, can I say, with anger, he tossed out the corrupt vendors. I, I, I love the picture. Uh, I don't know what happened to gentle Jesus, kind and mild here uh, that we sing in our Christmas carols, but he overthrew the tables. I won't do that, the keyboard. <laughs> Somebody panicked just for a second. They thought I was actually going to do it. And he threw this, and he, he tossed, and, and he overthrew the tables of the doves that were being sold for sacrifice. Can you imagine the chaos as these birds scattered everywhere? Coins scattered. I, I'm thinking these greedy guys are down on the ground trying to gather their coins so they don't get mixed up with the guys next to them. You know, the, greed does funny things. But Jesus established through that one moment, that one holy, holy moment of divine anger. Incredible chaos. But he was cleaning the house. He was furious with the religious leaders who gave bad directions who showed a bad example to those sincere seekers. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. His zeal is displayed 
In Isaiah 9, the passage that we read earlier, he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and with righteousness from that time on forever. And the zeal of the Lord's house, of the, the zeal of the Lord himself, the Lord Almighty, it says, will accomplish this. My Father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, a place to come, a place to find your way home. That's what church should be. And a place to come and ask. I enjoy, I enjoy going to Israel. We've been there a, f- a few times. And one of my favorite places is the, what we call the Western Wall. It's the one piece that, that remains of the original Temple Mount. And re- it's really, frankly, a retaining wall. But it's what remains of the days of Solomon. And you'll see there the Orthodox Jews and thousands of pilgrims like myself standing there at that wall and praying and weeping and sobbing and asking God's if, mercy and for God to intervene in circumstances. And you see people take little slips of paper and write their prayer requests and they jam those little slips of paper between and in the cracks of these beautiful big rocks. These, And you think, why do they do that? Well, it's a fulfillment of the prophetic word that Solomon gave when he dedicated the temple, you know, decades, centuries before. First Chronicles. And he said, in this long prayer of dedication, he said, God, when your people come here and they seek your face, would you hear them? And then he says, and Lord, the day, and when the day comes when foreigners come to this place and they come here with humble hearts to pray and to seek your face, Lord, would you hear them? Hear their prayers, answer their hearts, cry. God, would you move on their behalf? God, when they come here to this place, as Gentiles, may they encounter you. God's house. It's for everybody. It's a house of prayer for all nations. And I've, I've stood there on the Western Wall, my hands on the wall, my forehead against the wall, praying. And I remember I was leading, I was actually, Becky and I were leading a group, and they had to send someone in to get me because uh, we were supposed to move on to the next holy site that we were visiting. And I was lost in prayer because I, I sensed the presence of God, and all I could do was stand and weep. I, was, I had my forehead on a, on a rock wall. But it was a house of God. Not literally, but the presence of God was there. God remembers our prayers and he keeps his promises. When when Solomon prayed that prayer, the scripture says that the spirit of God came, filled the house as a demonstration of God says, you got it, boy, I'll do it. I'll do it. You prayed, I will fulfill this prayer. And he does it to this day. A, A place to come to ask, a place to come and find their way home to the Father. What was the results of this? When Jesus cleansed the temple, it was interesting. Here's the the fun part of the story. The kingdom of heaven was revealed and the family culture of the heavenly father was was released upon this place. It says that the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Here's the crazy thing about this because people that were imperfect were not invited into the temple or into the temple mount. They were were excluded. They They were rejected. They were not typically allowed to come be part of anything. But when Jesus cleansed the temple, he overthrew all those money changers. He made a mess of things. The people that felt welcomed and accepted were the people that desperately needed the Messiah. The lame and the blind came to the temple, and he healed them. They were welcome. They, they came with their brokenness, and they met the Messiah. Broken bodies and broken hearts were healed that day. That's the place of the Father as he extends his life through the church. And of course, secondarily, there was joy in the house of God. We find the kids uh, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, bless us, him that comes in the name of Hosanna, save us, is what Hosanna means. Save us from what? Despair, sickness, sin. But just maybe, just maybe there's a little bit of Hosanna, save us from religion. A religion that keeps people away from God. A, A system, a style that says, this is our protocol. But don't mess it up. The children broke into, into praise and worship because Jesus was in the house. The Messiah had come. And somehow kids get it. I don't know how this exactly works. But this was a pretty significant breach of protocol, by the way, because kids were to be seen and not heard. So when the kids burst out in worship and praise spontaneously in the temple courts, the religious leaders, they were incensed. They were indignant, the scripture tells us. But children know when it's safe and they know when it's authentic. This little point here. When, when I've seen God move prophetically and powerfully in services, the kids seem to get into it. And so there may be a day at Trinity Central when the Spirit of God lands on this place and the kids lead. 
there may be a day. I've seen it. I've seen kids come up and begin to pray for people, and healing happened while the children were praying for people. One of our dear friends leads the work in, in, in Kenya, and she, she trained kids in the work of the Holy Spirit, and just very gentle, as you would to children, the person in the work of the Holy Spirit. And a couple of the kids said, uh, there's a hospital next door. Can we can go and visit people in the hospital? These little kids, true story, went into the hospital and just began to wander up and down the wards, praying for people, and the hospital emptied out. Every single person in the hospital got healed. I don't know what that does to your, to your mind, but it blows mine. If it wasn't for the fact that I know this person really well, I, I might have thought they made the story up. But I know this person very, very well. Talk to me later. I'll give you the, I'll, I'll give you the link. You can, I'll, I'll, you can verify it yourself. But when God shows up, kids get it. There, there's something about children that, that's, that uh, their little spirits are sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit. They're, they're willing and they're eager to sense and, and to, to be empowered and be embraced by what God's doing. Kids naturally are drawn to Jesus and to his love. So we have the broken coming to Jesus for healing. We have children worshiping. A party broke out in church, by the way. A party breaking out in church might be a really good thing once in a while. There's joy in the house of the Lord. That would be a, wouldn't that be a wonderful change if the church was a happy place to be? Hmm. And then thirdly, we see the third group here. These were the religious leaders who, they were incensed. They were indignant. When they saw the wonderful things that he did, they saw it. When they saw the wonderful things that they did, instead of saying, hallelujah, and when they saw the children shouting praises, instead of saying, look at what God is doing, they said, stop. Stop. Stop it now. This doesn't fit our protocol. Stop. This is not appropriate. This is out of order. <laughs> and they dismissed the activity of the Spirit of God. They saw it. They experienced it. And they rejected it. You see, if your gig is religion... You're more interested in the events, the decorum, the programs, and the maintenance of image. But, but if you're a father of Jesus, you're far more interested in the care and the freedom and the healing that God wants to bring to the lives of the people. Regardless of whether they're royalty or commoners, whether they're broken or whole, whether they're hopeless or whether they're filled with joy, even if it's messy at times, God wants to show up because if our goal is the love and the care of people, it will be messy at times. I'm going to tell a story, then we're going to start wrapping this up. We know there was a season in the life uh, of our church in California when we were touched with renewal in the 1990s. I remember it, it, just, it just was, it was odd. It was a wonderfully odd, delightful season. People were getting saved on a regular basis, and we, we saw... God moved powerfully among the young people. Matter of fact, you, you could not find a seat in the front because the kids would come in, the high school or, high school or in college age, and they'd fill the front up. And not just the seats, but all the area around the, the platform. It was a wonderful time of God's moving. But our offerings here, here's an example of how messy it can be. Our offerings were a little strange because these kids didn't have much, but they wanted to, to give to God as a demonstration of the changed life. And so the offerings, as they, we would pass the plate in those days, I remember getting things like cigarette lighters and uh, switchblades. I remember getting uh, lottery tickets. Now, that was always a good thing, you know, hallelujah. We got bandanas and gang colors put in the offering plate. But the highlight of all offering gifts was a little bag of white powder that showed up in the offering plate one day. And our treasurer came to me at the end of the service with eyes about this wide. What do we do with this? I said, well, we're sure not keeping it, that's for sure. And uh, so uh, it, it was messy. Like, what do you do with a bag of white powder in the offering plate? First of all, you, you thank God that it was in the offering plate, right? That someone gave that up. But it gets messy because new believers or people that are seekers, they don't, they don't know how to... They're not like all of you and me who, who have been in church for like a thousand years. We know exactly how to do this. They, they, they kind of make a mess and they kind of raise ruckus and they kind of get excited and they kind of do things like, Hosanna, save us. And they kind of, a, a spontaneous worship service breaks out in the middle of a very distinguished group of people. 
And maybe there's a second offering that has weird things in it. And maybe someone gets healed. And maybe some blind eyes get opened. And maybe another worship service happens because blind eyes get opened. And maybe this just goes on and on. And maybe you don't know how to close the service because there's not an easy way to close it. And maybe, just maybe prophetic words start to happen. And God starts to heal people spontaneously because of words. And maybe it gets messy. And maybe it's glorious. And maybe God cleans his house. And maybe, just maybe... It becomes a house of prayer for all nations. And just maybe this Emmanuel God with us says, "Ah, I'm welcomed here in my own house. And the blind and the lame and the broken and the children come. Because if Emmanuel God with us shows up, everything changes. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given and the government will rest upon his shoulders. What would God's house look like? What will we see break out here among us? How will lives be transformed by God's grace? What miraculous healings, what powerful deliverances will we see? What signs of the kingdom will break out among us? And his name shall be called Wonderful Supernatural Counselor, who will speak words that lead to eternal life. His name shall be called Mighty God, the one who grants us victory over every foe, over every area of darkness, over every sickness, over every disease. His name shall be called Everlasting Father, the Father from eternity who promises to care, to provide, to protect his most beloved children. His name shall be called Prince of Peace, the one who brings shalom, who provides wholeness, the one who prospers our soul with tranquility, the one who gives us his care. His name shall be called. And he will reign on David's throne and of the greatness of his government, the greatness, the greatness of his government and peace, there'll be no end. I'm, I'm really tired. I'm really tired of being places and being part of groups where the one that's great is the guy that's on the platform. I think, the, I think the temple needs to get cleaned where, where Jesus takes his place and he's the one that we worship and we magnify him and the greatness of his kingdom and his peace that, that he would come in power and we would be in awe of him. And may God grant us the day in this place when the ministers can't minister in the temple because when the greatness of God showed up at the dedication of both the first and the second temple, the priest could not stand to minister because of his greatness. Wouldn't that be a day? Wouldn't that be a wonderful, wonderful day when God shows up? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His government and his peace will be no end. And the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. It is not going to be our band or our preaching or our spectacular kids' ministry. It's going to be Jesus. It's going to be Jesus. It's got to be Jesus. That's the goal. Uh, Worship team, if you want to come, and we're we're going to wrap here at this point. God with us. Here's my challenge to us. What role will you embrace in this story? There are three basic roles that I see here. The first role is are you broken or brokenhearted and you need to come to Jesus for healing? Because when God was in the house, healing broke out. The second role that we see here is the children who just were exuberant, enthusiastic in their worship and praise. Their hearts were filled with uncontainable joy because the presence of Jesus. That's what I want, by the way. I I want to live, not just today. This is not an invitation just for this moment. But I'm asking you, who do you want to be? I want to be a, um, first of all, I want to be both number one and number two. I want to be a person who recognizes that I have a desperate need of Jesus every day of my life. And I can bring, with his welcome, my brokenness into his presence. (laughs) And he wants to come and touch and heal and restore. That he's the God who wants to bring shalom and wholeness to my heart. But secondarily, I want to be that guy that, that enjoy, knows no limitations. Today, as we were worshiping and, and Ash was leading us in one of the songs, there's a piece of me, I'll be honest, that just wanted to go up front here and just dance across the front of the, of, of the, of the and then I thought, but I'm the preacher and I need to be dignified. 
I, and so it, the fear of man has caused me to hesitate. Does, he, does that happen to you as well? I, I, I kind of want to be made a spectacle of it, but sometimes when your heart is just full of uncontainable joy and gratitude for Jesus, I, I don't know, but man, my words just aren't enough, and all I could do is just kind of do this, and you know, with my heart, but my feet, you know, are kind of stuck to the ground. Maybe that's the Swiss German in me that needs to get a little bit, I need to get delivered from that, whatever that is. But what if uncontainable joy was our lot? And we filled that role. What if? What if our bodies could not contain the overflowing sense of God's presence? And it had to break out in spontaneous dance like David when he brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem where he danced before the Lord with all his might. It must have been a scene, huh? Because his wife, Micah, looked down and she said, look at you. You're making a spectacle of yourself in front of all the people of Israel. And David's response was, I'll be more vile tomorrow than this. Just watch me. Because God is worthy. It's not about us. We come to him in our brokenness. We can come to him as children filled with overflowing joy. Or we can come to God like the religious who would prefer those predictable programs, cultural decorum, and a system that functions quite well, thank you, without the presence of God. Man, I don't want to be that guy. I do not want to be that guy. So I'm asking you to join me, and this be number one and number two, and this, this lock forever, door number three, and simply saying, I want everything that God has for me and for us in this season. Are you with me in this? That's the heart of God, because when he shows up, everything changes. Emmanuel, God, with us. Ah, I'm done with religion. Are you? Let's stand together. You got a song for us? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs>